Okay, good. Let's get started. Um, so welcome. Happy holidays, all kinds of holidays this weekend, Easter, Ramadan, Passover. I'm Melissa, uh, stepping in for Trudy for today. She's in Maui. Um, if you're new to this group, we'll start with a guided meditation and then we'll have a discussion, today's discussion on the five strengths of the heart, five strengths of the human heart. Um, so we'll practice mindfulness to begin. So set up a comfortable posture. And remember that mindfulness is a habit of the mind. And everything that appears in our mind, our thoughts, our emotions, the afflictive mind states, they do so not from a self that is like that, but from a habit. So we are a series of events, as Ram Dass said. And this habit of present moment awareness deepens the intimacy of our hearts and the intimacy with what causes stress and suffering to arise for us, what causes the heart mind to become muddied and unclear and doubtful and fearful and angry and contracted. There are causes that make those afflictions arise and then there are causes that make joy, liberation, freedom, clarity, lucidity, compassion to arise. And this process of mindfulness, the really wonderful and beautiful thing about mindfulness is that all we have to do is the very simple technique of observing present moment experience, and then the beautiful qualities of the mind, they naturally start to grow and take over. They can take over your whole heart and all of the afflictions, they start to recede because they're seen for what they are, just troublemakers that don't, <laughs> that don't bring us any, any joy, any peace. So as you set up your posture, Make sure you're comfortable and at ease in your body. Bring your attention inward. And let go of any physical gripping or holding. Around your head or your shoulders. Come deep in your belly. And bringing the attention to your breath, but as you bring attention to your breath, also using the breath to relax any activity in your body. Breathing in and relaxing the activity of your body. Breathing out and relaxing the activity of the body.
and allowing yourself to let go of plans, thoughts of the future. Let go of past experiences. And giving your awareness a little break from all of that. Let it rest on the breath when breathing in, know you're breathing in. When breathing out, know you're breathing out. And if your life is busy, you might need to use those words in the mind. Breathing in on the inhale. Breathing out on the exhale. Awareness doesn't take a lot of effort, a light touch is required. And one that welcomes whatever the experiences of your body or mind are. When other sensations in our bodies arise, bringing attention close, the vibration, tingling, heat, coolness, movement in the body. Watching if tension arises and re-relaxing body, re-relaxing the mind.
I'm gaining an intimacy with thoughts, feelings, and emotions. We're not trying to stop these things from happening, but we're exploring them, studying them. So look now in your heart to name what is the actual mind state present? Are you tired? Are you worried? Is your heart unsettled? Is there joy? Is there calm? Allowing everything and observing, this is what this is like right now. Releasing any and all self-condemnation. Any and all expectation. Our only job to know what our actual experience is. This moment, this breath. One breath at a time.
And as this awareness grows, becomes brighter, more clear, more luminous, more lucid. It reveals the resistance we're clinging to that we don't need. And we let go. That unseen heaviness, that unseen burden. Trusting awareness.
And as we are quiet and still, our attention will be able to become more subtle. Bring your attention closer to more subtle experiences of the breath. Seeing where you can release more subtle clinging in the body. More subtle fluctuations of thought and mental imagery. Feelings and emotions. as they arise and pass away. Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Melissa McKay. If uh, you just joined, I'm stepping in for Trudy, who is in doing some practice in Maui right now. Um, I really enjoyed organizing this talk that I've prepared for today on uh, Pancha Bala. Pancha Bala are called the five spiritual faculties, sometimes the five strengths, the five powers. Pancha means five, Bala means power, strength, or force. And uh, these are five qualities that exist in all of us. I've been hearing about the five faculties, spiritual faculties, uh, since I've been practicing. They're mentioned a lot by the monks and in Asia um they would refer to these a lot and i think i took them as something that was outside of myself for a long time i took them in a doctrinal kind of way it's helpful at times to think about the buddhist practice system as a system of psychology in the same way that when we hear these about these faculties of mind we listen to them like we would a doctor talking about anatomy because these are qualities that are not buddhist but they're human emotions or human experiences and like i said during the meditation we are always just habituating something in our mind and so buddhist practice is seeing that there are qualities that we can grow and habituate. Our minds are like a garden and there are causes and conditions that make the qualities that we want to arise, arise. And that's what practice helps us to do. So these, these five powers are Sada, Virya, Sati, Samadhi, and Panya. Sada is faith. Virya is effort or energy, vigor, uh, mindfulness, sati is mindfulness, uh, samadhi, concentration, 
and Panya is wisdom. So they have their opposites. They are powers in that when they are present in our mind, they overcome their opposites. So Helen Keller said, there is great suffering in the world, but there also is the overcoming of it. And that's what the Four Noble Truths point to, that there is suffering in our mind, but there's an overcoming of it. We can overcome the suffering of the mind. So we can overcome the opposites of these mind states which create stress for us. The opposite of sada is doubt. The opposite of virya, energy, is that heaviness of mind, laziness, sloth, and torpor. The opposite of mindfulness, awareness, is forgetfulness. The opposite of concentration is distraction. And the opposite of wisdom is confusion. So we, we can see in our direct experience when we're doubtful, when we're lazy, when we're forgetful, when we're distracted. Actually, when I started to write this talk yesterday, I was really distracted. My mind just kept wanting to go and run and do other things. It kept wanting to, and that feeling is, it's uh, unpleasant, it's stressful. The distracted mind is stressful. But I just implemented the tools, kept my mind, removed distractions, became more intentional about not getting up, about not looking uh, on other websites or whatever my mind was being tempted to do. And eventually, composure came, concentration came, because I conditioned it to. Huh? So that that is a mind state that we can condition to focus. And of course, it serves everything that we do, our work, our relationships. When the mind is there and clear, then stress isn't there. So Buddha said, I teach one thing and one thing only, stress and the end of stress. Uh, nothing that he taught was to be believed. There's not a doctrinal system here. He said everything that he taught, we should try and see for ourselves, is it true that this decreases stress in my heart, in my mind, that this increases clarity, luminosity, happiness, strength, confidence. So in the questions for uh, to uh, by King Melinda to Nagasena, this occurred apparently a couple hundred years after uh, the Buddha. Um, this teaching was given on these five strengths, and Nagasena included also the practice of virtue or morality as a foundation that supports the arisal of all these other qualities. Um, that of non-harming, of not slandering others, of not speaking divisively about others, of being truthful, of protecting life, of not being violent. All of those are foundational in all of Buddhist systems and all of Buddhist practice. We probably practice all of them every day at some point. It's good to bring our attention to the fact that we practice those every day because it will bring um, an ease in our nervous system. And when we don't, you know, the other day I was kind of short with my husband. And then later in the day, you know, just too quick, spoke aversively to him, I was angry. Later in the day, this remorse was arising in me, this real, ah, I didn't feel that great about myself. Well, that's just a cause and effect. That's what happens in our psyches. We feel very good and clear and confident. We're like, oh, I handled that very well. I spoke with compassion. We feel good when we help others. So it is foundational for, for our psyches to be clear. Of course, many people practice without establishing that, and you can. It just makes it a lot harder. But faith grows, and concept, the ability to focus and concentrate the stillness of the mind, the serenity of the mind, grows when we're intentional about not harming. So Nagasena said, as all plants and animals which increase, grow, and prosper, do so with the earth as their support, and with the earth as their basis, just so the practitioner, with morality, virtue, sila, as their support and, and, and basis, develops these five strengths. So the first one being sada, faith, 
might bring up a certain point to a certain quality that you've experienced before. Within Pali, it is also translated as trust and confidence. So faith within Buddhist practice is never, um, it's never desired for there to be a blind faith, to adopt any set of beliefs. But the Buddha said, see for yourself if these things lead to stress, then, then, then abandon them. If these things lead to harmony, to well-being, to happiness, then live and abide in them. We see for ourselves. So it's that kind of verified faith that is possible within the Buddhist system. But this quality of faith is something that we're familiar with. We have it and it's good. And I, I want to structure this talk so that we start to identify it within ourselves and trust it more. Faith in ourselves, trust and confidence in ourselves. So when uh, King Melinda asked Nagasena what the mark of faith was, he replied, and I love this, faith makes serene and it leaps forward. So we know that action in our hearts of, of leaping, not hesitating, but leaping forward. The king asked him for an illustration and Nagasena said, a king might with his great army cross over a stream, stirred up by elephants and horses, by the chariots and infantry, the water would become disturbed and muddy. The king had a miraculous water cleaning gem and asked his men to throw it into the stream so they could drink. Then all of the fragments of vegetation would float away, the mud would settle at the bottom, and the stream would become clear, serene, undisturbed, and fit to drink. The stream corresponds to our hearts, the heart-mind. The king's men correspond to the practitioner, and the dirt to the defilements or afflictions of the mind to worries, to our self-doubts, to the hesitation, to the fears, to the contracted mind. And the miraculous water clearing gem to faith. So I love that analogy, that faith, when it's present in us, clears our minds of all of those other kinds of afflictions, of the dirt, of the mud that can settle. So we know that feeling, you know the feeling, right? There's probably certain activities in your life that you know your heart leaps forward. It's, it's easy for you. And there's certain activities in your life that you hesitate, that the mind gets more muddy, right? For me, I'm writing right now. Writing is not easy for me. I, I'm hesitating while I'm doing it. It's, it's harder. It's, uh, there's not a leaping forward because I don't have the confidence in, in my ability. I play pickleball too and I play pickleball I don't hesitate with pickleball <laughs> the activity for me is very confident I leap forward it's something that I know that I can do but no matter what these qualities can be conditioned I can condition a confidence in writing by exposing myself to it by doing it by going through the doubt by going through the hesitation by seeing through the wor the worry so it's, it's good for us to know what are the places in life that we don't hesitate, that we feel some confidence so that we are able to identify this is a more trustworthy uh, quality of heart. And of course, the faith that is being really valued is that within the Buddhist practice. And that grows as we see when we do this practice, there's a benefit that comes to us. It works, it helps, it leads me upward and it does it again and again and again and again. And that kind of faith can be so solidly verified that there's not even a strain or a hint of doubt. You know, you know I do this. When I sit in my meditation practice, it's never hurt. <laughs> it's painful sometimes, but it always leads to something that is beneficial. It's difficult sometimes, but it always leads to something that is good. It never hasn't in all these years that I've been doing it. So that's the kind of faith that, that we leap for. This will always, always help. And it's not 
oh, it's not f at first established, but we connect to the causes, you know, again and again, see, oh, oh, I did the practice and I was helped by it. Connect the causes and the effects like we talked about last time I was here. The person that came to my class and said, I'm trying to pay attention to the causes and effects in my life. It's such a beautiful intention because re reality is what we're trying to see and reality and nature will always be there to reveal itself to us. So when we see a practitioner sees the hearts of others that have been set free, they leap forward by way of inspiration for the fruits of practice. Says uh, Nagasena, just as those standing on the banks of a river and wanting to cross hesitate as they are unable to tell either the width or the depth of the river. But then a man comes along aware of his strength and power were to jump across the river and those standing on the side would likewise cross. So the observation of others that have overcome suffering can awaken this in us, our own faith and confidence to take the steps forward. Well, that inspiration of seeing others do it. Emotionally, faith is an attitude of serenity and confidence and lucidity. I said at the beginning, the opposite of a doubt, but there's another opposite of faith. Does anybody have an idea of another opposite of faith? You can put it in the comments. What's an opposite of faith? Okay, I'll give you the answer. <laughs> Here's worry. Distrust, hopelessness. Yeah, those are good ones. Yeah. Worry, worry, worry is the opposite of faith. So when faith is arising and we could cultivate it, we can bring up the quality, we can make it stronger in ourselves, it can grow, it can be the stronger habit of mind than worry is. But when it is there, it's said that the five terrors are lost in us, the five great fears of humans. What do you suppose some of those are? Five great fears of being a human. What do we fear? Illness and death, great. Death, great. Yeah, that's a clear one. Pain, of course, but that's not what all of these are painful experience, but it's not listed as one. Insecurity is good. It's pointing to one of them. Loss. Not belonging. Perfect. Exactly. So these five great fears that we experience as human can be overcome. There is the experiencing of these fears and the overcoming of them with faith. Uh, so they're, they're named here as the loss of life, death, as you guys pointed out, the loss of livelihood, the loss of reputation, public speaking, and then the fifth one is listed differently from different sources that I have found. So I'm just going to name all of them because some might resonate more with you guys than others. Illness, as some of you have named, a supernatural event, a bad rebirth, or the fear of losing one's mind. So these five great fears are, are we might, in some subconscious way, rely on the worry that our minds perpetuate of losing our livelihood, of losing our, of having a bad reputation, of losing our life, of losing our Ill, uh, illness. And this worry can be something that is kind of whispering in the back of our mind and, and we're walking around with it all day. We don't realize it's interfering with the lucidity of the mind. We don't realize it's, it's interfering with our ability to act wisely in the world or to act with confidence. And so this quality of just believing it's all going to be okay. It's all going to be okay. And it, it surely will be okay when we are practicing the Dharma, because that is 
practicing putting goodness into the world. And when we put goodness into the world, then we become protected. So faith arises in people. I haven't given the talk about the temperaments here. I don't know if you've heard about the Buddhist temperaments, but there are the three temperaments that are negative and then there are three opposites. We are either more driven by greed, hatred, or delusion. And the opposites of those are faith, uh, wisdom, and uh, a wiser speculation mind, a broader mind, broad-mindedness. So faith arises easily in those that are more greed-oriented temperaments. And in the Visuddhimagga, it says, as on the unwholesome plate, greed clings and takes no offense, so faith on the wholesome plane. As greed searches for objects of sense desires, you know, pleasant experiences, so faith for the qualities, for the beautiful qualities of the heart and compassion, you know, is moved by beauty, is moved by generosity of others or, or uh, is touched by um, non-harming, is touched by non-violence. As greed does not let go of that which is harmful, faith does not let go of that which is beneficial. So the arousal of faith in our practice will make us inspired, of course, and want to practice more because we know it's going to continue to lead to benefit. We know we'll be nourished by it. We know we'll be rejuvenated by it. And that is something that we don't have to let go of, right? We're wanting to let go of that which brings us suffering, that which limits us, that which creates resistance and pain. Uh, Karen, the five uh, terrors that they are called, or the five great fears. Um, here, a Buddhist scholar, Edward Kanzi, said, there are ages of faith and ages of unbelief. The present age, rather, and he died in the 70s, but I feel like this is more true even today. The present age rather fosters unbelief. It puts a premium on intellectual smartness so that faith is easily held to indicate nothing but a weak head or a lack of intellectual integrity. It multiplies the distractions from the sensory world to such an extent that the calm of the invisible world is harder to reach than ever. It exposes the citizens to so great a variety of conflicting viewpoints that they find it hard to make a choice. The prestige of science, the concern for a high standard of living, and the disappearance of all institutions of uncontested authority are the chief foes of faith in our present day society. It is largely a matter of temperament, whether we believe that matters will improve in the near future. As a virtue, faith is strengthened and built up by self-discipline and by not and not by discussing opinions intellectually difficulties are by no means the most powerful among the obstacles of faith doubts are inevitable but how one deals with them depends on one's character and one's character of course is something that is pliant it, one's character is something that we're developing just when we're practicing mindfulness and when we practice mindfulness that awareness of exposing the mind to those things that are not serving us, us, not serving us anymore, they become loosened up and not so much a part of our character. We let them go. And then the beautiful qualities come in. So our character changes, it strengthens. And of course, he kind of is criticizing the prestige of science. We know when we, we love the scientific method, that of reason, that of needing to show proof. And that is encouraged 
within the Buddhist uh, practical system, but also the humility to know that these five senses that we have here are actually very limited and that there are more subtle movements happening. There is a deeper world that we can't see, but we can tune into when we sharpen our intellect, when we sharpen our minds, the power of our mind with concentration. So I came from, I grew up Catholic. My faith was something then that was a belief and something that I could never see or prove. It was still a beautiful experience for me. There's something higher. There was a letting go in that, that, that served me. But now as faith comes within my Buddhist practice, it is finding that quality and then trusting the practice itself that it does and will surely bring benefit. But what we want is to, with our mindfulness practice, to begin to identify this quality and to trust it more than we do the worries. Worry presents ourself, itself in our mind as something that is helping us, as something that we need. When we study worry, we study it closely, we see, well, I won't give you the answer, but you see, when does it help you? <laughs> and what, what is better? What is a stronger quality? So I'm not going to go into the other four because uh, Faith has taken up so much time here, but I'll just me mention very briefly each of the other four. Virya is effort or energy, and King Melinda uh, asked what the mark of effort or energy is, and he said that effort, vigor, virya, props up, and when propped up, the wholesome dharmas, meaning the positive mental uh, habits of mind do not dwindle away just as if a house was falling down one would prop it up with a new piece of wood so that the house would not collapse so that effort that reminder that practice actually does take an effort a doing of something of putting our energy towards a certain intention and direction and then that props up our mindfulness practice, it props up our concentration practice. And then the king asked the mark of mindfulness and he said, uh, the mark of mindfulness is calling to mind and taking up. When mindfulness arises, one calls to mind that which is beneficial and that which leads to harm. So as we practice mindfulness here, we're observing our present moment experience as we're happen as it's happening. And then we take that quality into our life, which is a thing that can make us just pause and say, okay, what course of action, what course of word, what course of thinking will be useful and helpful in this kind of in this situation. And I liked this analogy too. So when mindfulness arises, one calls to mind that which is wholesome and unwholesome, that which leading to harm and leading to benefit, the dark and the light. And they tend to that which should be tended and do not tend to that which should not. We don't need to tend to our fears and imagination of the worst case scenarios. Does your mind ever tend to that? <laughs> We don't need to tend to self-hatred. Does your mind ever tend to that? The inner critic. We don't need to tend to resentments or brooding over the faults of other people. We can let those go. Like a treasurer of a king who each day reminds the king of his magnificent assets. So many elephants you have, so many horses, so many chariots so much infant, infantry, so many gold coins, so much bullion, so much property, in this way, calling to mind his wealth. That's an analogy for calling to mind and remembering the beautiful qualities of the human heart. 
And concentration, the difference between concentration and mindfulness, mindfulness is awareness of present moment experience. Concentration is when the mind can stay singular and focused without movement, without getting distracted. So we can be mindful and concentration not really be there, right? And concentration is the support, says Nagasena, for all of the other good qualities to arise. And then the last one being wisdom. I often translate wisdom as knowing that which will lead to benefit, that, that which will lead, that which will be helpful and knowing that which leads to suffering. Nagasena said that the mark of wisdom is cutting off and it illuminates. When wisdom arises, it dispels the darkness of ignorance, generates the illumination of knowledge, sheds the light of cognition, and makes the noble truth, reality, the way things are, stand out clearly. He said, like a lamp that one would take into a dark house. So just to review these strengths, remember we have them in us already. Don't think of yourself as like, oh, I don't have faith or I don't have wisdom or I don't have concentration or I'm always distracted. We all have the seeds of those and we can nurture them and help them to grow in our hearts at any point. And just practicing mindfulness does that. It strengthens all of these factors. So faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, that one-pointed attention, and wisdom. Okay, so I'll stop talking and then we can open up for uh, questions or discussion. I prefer to take questions by people whose cameras are on and who will verbalize their questions because a lot gets lost in those kind of text questions. Feel free to raise your hand if you have a question. The virtual hand? Yes. Go ahead, Robert. Hi, Robert. You just need to take your um, unmute yourself. Okay. Um, okay. Usually, it's it's sort of like I'm carried away, and then every now and then, maybe an hour later, I remember something that I should have been paying attention to. But it's sort of like the boat has, the, the canoe has gone downstream. And um, so I guess you strengthen these by being aware. I mean, categorizing what's going on and thinking about it. Um, seems difficult. <laughs> Yes, it is difficult, exactly. Yes, and but the important thing when we hear this is to know that that's the natural way is forgetfulness. That's the way all minds are. It's not particular to you, Robert. And that the quality of remembering, which is sati, is something that needs to be conditioned. It doesn't happen by itself. So we have that understanding of our bodies that we have to walk them, we have to exercise them, we have to condition them in a certain way for their health. And it's the same, and the meditation practice is conditioning the qualities of the mind. And so it's universal, so we shouldn't blame ourselves. The conditions that arise in our mind of forgetfulness is, is more the norm and it takes intention and then repetition and a lot of patience and we do it a moment at a time and that's all we need to do is one moment and we we repeat it and the unfolding of the depth and understanding of practice comes gradually it's a gradual training but it takes a training 
and it is a discipline. And if we do it, you know, on Sundays and then forget the rest of the week, then we're, that, you know, I mean, that's, we'll get the, those particular conditions of our mind. But mm -hmm. if we have some discipline and structure, then little by little, you know, and, and don't identify with the negative qualities of your mind. None of us should. They're just visitors. We should identify more with a deeper natural luminosity and see that this forgetfulness, we don't want it. We don't want to be forgetful. We don't want to be lost in muddy thoughts of past events or future imaginings. You know, they take up a lot of mental space. We don't want it and yet they arise. So it's best to not think of that as ourself and just take more heart in those moments. Right now I'm remembering. And then you can remember again and be aware again and gather attention again and again and again. And it's never too late to do that. We get strengthened by a, another moment. We start now and you do it again and, and it strengthens and strengthens like little drops of rain that accumulate into puddles and then into lakes and then rivers and oceans. Yeah. Go ahead, uh, other Robert, another Robert. <laughs> Only Roberts were allowed to speak today. Only Roberts from here on out. Um, what I'm aware of is I've gotten much better in meditation of coming back without judgment. I'm much less scattered. Honestly, and when teachings happen is when I get my concentration goes. So I'm just putting it out there. I suppose that I need to do the same kind of uh, work when teachings are going on. That That's when I start to like, ah, you don't have to pay attention. I'm going on to other things. And I, um, I'm not sure what that's about. So just thought I'd put it out there. You mean like when you show up to this group or, or whatever? I, not just this group, just groups. As soon as teachings happen, like I can be, if there's guided meditation, so I'm able to stay with it. As soon as the teachings, I don't know if it's, I'm not sure what that's about. So uh, I've just noticed. So at the very, la like the last two minutes of your work, you know, the work you did today, and you're talking about concentration. I, I started to concentrate during the teaching as well. And so, um, I don't know. I think I'm, I'm, you know, there's a confessing to spur me on. <laughs> Well, you'll study your own mind and see the motivations. You'll be able to know better than anybody outside of you. But maybe it's just that you let go a little bit, you know, let go of the effort. And so then the mind gets uh, gets kind of distracted. And, and so, yeah, and uh, it changed for the last two minutes. So I have to start that at the beginning of the teachings rather than wait for the last two minutes of it. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, and thanks. Good to see you, Robert. Go ahead, Ritz. Oh, hi. Hi, everybody. Um, greetings from Peru. I'm in Peru right now. <laughs> and so just keep thinking about stillness of uh, the mind, that phrase you said. Um, how much does letting go um, is involved with that? Like, it feels like it's some kind of magic power like to have the ability to learn to let go um so yeah i would like you to um, it is kind of magic power but we have magic powers so. <laughs> <laughs> we can the mind can do very strong and magical seemingly magical things uh, and we hone that power with the training of the mind and concentration and and mindfulness but you'll observe in, in yourself, you can incline the mind to let go. And that's a good thing to do. We can incline our mind towards faith. We can incline the mind towards calm, mm -hmm. but it won't necessarily make it arise in us. We also have to do uh, other things. And so for the letting go, what do we want to let go of? Remember is only the things that are creating suffering for us. Mm -hmm. And that's universal. Every human that you can think of that you know about it, it they experience dukkha, stress. And so those are the things that we want to let go of, the clinging to those habits and, and uh, conditioning, that conditioning. 
but you'll see that the proximate cause, the thing that needs to arise before we let go is clearly see. And so mindfulness, when we clearly see that we're holding on to something that's not serving, it's like we can hold tension up in our shoulders. In fact, I am right now as I'm speaking. And somebody mm -hmm. puts their hands on our shoulders and then, the, oh, I didn't realize. So it's the same with a lot of the movements in the mind. Like, oh, I didn't realize. So mindfulness, keeping sustained attention on the activities of the mind, thoughts, feelings, mm -hmm. emotions, and intentions. And every single person has a whole bunch of stuff that perpetuates pain and suffering for themselves. And so on more and more refined levels, it's the letting go of that. So within your practice, you can incline the mind to let go, but it, you have to see clearly that that thing is mm -hmm. no longer worthy of holding on to. And then you won't have to will letting go, you just will. The heart will just let go. Thank you so much. Sending lots of love to everybody here. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Meredith. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. Um, I really, really enjoyed your talk. Thank you so much. Um, gee, there are a bunch of things, but. Um, <clears throat> somewhere near the beginning, you talked about heaviness, feeling heaviness and just letting it go. Rick Hansen talks about, I mean, he's the person I remember, probably a lot of people do, but um, letting it drain out of your body. I don't know if it's just that I think it's too simple, so I won't. I mean, is that possible? Just like pretending it's something fluid and letting it drain out of your body <laughs> I, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit a, a little bit related to what Ritz just said uh and and it's um you know this Meredith is going to be best seen in right in your experience you see for yourself is it possible is it possible yeah, I tried. But an excuse but an inclination yeah that's okay an inclination of the mind to let go of what I'm calling, these are words, of course, and words we all hold differently, but what I'm calling heaviness, which is a feeling of the heart that feels burdened, that doesn't feel light, the mind doesn't feel pliant, it doesn't feel that kind of heaviness. There can only be an inclination. But again, like I said to Ritz, that uh, this clear seeing helps us to release all of the things that that are there that are binding to us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so let's now close with some um meta practice huh? we'll do a little meta practice and i want to do this practice because um it's very close to the quality of sada to the quality of faith because when metta is there then worry can't be there at the same time And a, a faith starts to automatically be there, a kind of sense of trust. It's like a feeling of security, but in, in that which is reliable for ourselves. And when we cultivate compassion or metta in the heart, we do so by putting our attention, which is so often absorbed by negative thinking, we put our attention on intentional thoughts, which still the mind and then bring up this quality. So give yourself a very comfortable posture. You, you can lie down if you'd like to. You want to have a lot of ease in your body and we've been sitting for a while now. And if you lie down, you don't want your camera on you. You can, of course, turn that off. I didn't have this when I first started practicing, but now I have this feeling of a leaping forward towards metta, towards these thoughts, nurturing them, nourishing them, growing them, as I know they lead to benefit.
So relax any tension or holding in your body, in your head, your heart center, your belly. And then bring an image of yourself safe, protected. free from physical and mental pain, free from stress. And then send these thoughts right into your blood, your bones, your organs. May I be safe healthy, happy, and peaceful. May I be safe, healthy, happy, and peaceful. And then extend these thoughts to your family, those that are dear to you and everybody here in this community. Your refuge for your Sunday. Let different people come into your mind, see them well, see them safe, strong, happy. And repeating the thoughts, may my friends and family be safe, healthy, happy, and peaceful. The all minds scatter and wander and just gently gather them again and again. And taking heart again in the moments that they're gathered rather than the moments that they're scattered. May my friends and family be safe, healthy, happy, and peaceful.
And then extend and radiate those thoughts north, south, east, west, above and below, out to all beings everywhere. Including yourself, including your friends and family and all beings, excluding no one. May all beings everywhere be safe, healthy, happy and peaceful. <laughs>